Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to our morning Bhagavatam class. Uh, this morning, we're very fortunate to have with us His Holiness Chandramali Swami from UK. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you. We are so fortunate and blessed. Uh, looking, always look forward to hearing your classes, Maharaj. Um, it's all yours. Maharaj will be speaking on Canto 1, Chapter 3, Verse 10. Okay, thank you. Just for clarification, I'm in Slovenia. Oh, Slovenia. All right. <laughs> thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> Just for clarification. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. I'm glad I, I got that one. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll begin. <clears throat> Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 1310. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Uh, Panchama Kapilo Nama Siddhasad Kalad Viputam. <laughs> Acharyare Sakyam Tatpagrama Vinirnayam Translation The fifth incarnation named Lord Kapila is foremost among perfected beings. He gave an exposition of the creative elements and metaphysics to Asuri Ramani, Ramana. For in course of time this knowledge had been lost. <laughs> Very short report. Um, the sum total of the creative elements is 24 in all. Each and every one of them is explicitly explained in the system of Sankhya philosophy. Sankhya philosophy is generally called metaphysics by the European scholars. The etymological meaning of Sankhya is that which explains very lucidly my analysis of the material elements. This was done for the first time by Lord Kapila, who is said herein to be the fifth in the line of incarnations. Omukyan, Timirandasya, Gina, Jana, Salakaya, Chaksu, Unmilitam, Yena, Tasmai, Shri Guru, Vena, Maha, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Vorvani Pracharine Nirvishesa Sunyavari Vastyatya Desatarine Jai Shri Krishna Jaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadahar Srivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchakopa, Tarubhischa, Kripa Sindhu, Vyavacha, Patitanam, Bhavane Bhyo, Vaishnave Bhyo, Namaha. So this uh, third chapter of the first canto pretty much delineates one after another the different incarnations of the Lord and gives a little of information on each one. It's a very interesting chapter. And it also ends with a very key verse on the 28th verse, where it explains that out of all the manifestations and incarnations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna is the source and the original. So here we are speaking of Lord Kapila Dev. <clears throat> Lord Kapila Dave is, um, can everyone still hear me? I think there was some switch here. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Lord Kapila Dave is known as Devahuti, Devahuti Putra. He was the son of Kodama Muni and Devahuti. He appeared after. Devahuti had nine daughters. Uh, Devahuti was a uh, a daughter of Swayambhuva Manu, who was the, the ruler of the universe. 
uh, each of the Manus come in different time periods. And the Swayambhu Manu was, and his wife, Satarupa, Satarupi, they were ideal in their spiritual practice. And of course, the Manus are also mentioned as one of the incarnations of the Lord. So they had a daughter named Devahuti and uh, one great sage, his name was Kardama Muni, he wanted to get married. Although he was completely detached from everything material, for some reason, and it becomes unknown in the real sense, he just desired a wife, not in the long term, but just to have a child and then move on. Of course, we can say that this was the arrangement by the Lord because that child was um, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Kapila Dev. Now in the history of society, there are two Kapila Devs. There's the Dev Devahuti Putra, who is the incarnation of the Lord. And then there's a atheistic uh, Kapila who because he is actually more popular in the second secular world because he he uh, went through the whole idea of the Sankhya philosophy, and that's really what the Europeans study. They study Kapila Dave's, the atheistic Kapila Dave's uh, Sankhya philosophy. Although he's quite correct, he's still an atheist, and so we don't give him any credit. <laughs> And uh, it mentions that there are 24 elements um, which make up the combination of everything material. If you break down the material energy into its different uh, components, you'll find that there are 24 elements. I believe it's the five workings, the, the five knowledge acquiring senses, the five working senses, the mind, the, the uh, senses, um, the sense objects, uh, the, uh, what else? Sense objects, uh, the three modes of material nature. Uh, I can't remember all of them. But it comes to a total of 24. Some people, of course, the Vaishnavas say there's 25, and the 25th is the super soul, which is not a material element, but is a feature of the material energy, in that he stays within the material energy to guide the living entity in their activities. So uh, Sankhya philosophy is quite an in-depth study because they break it apart and, and it becomes quite boring and mundane when you study it. But when you read it in the Srimad Bhagavatam in relationship to the process of bhakti, it becomes really interesting. Especially the 26th chapter of the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam third canto, Prabhupada makes some very interesting statements in regards to scientific theories that will that are going on. Uh, if you could bring up 326, um, I think it's 34, it may be 32, but let's, I think it's 34. If you could bring that up on the screen, you'll find it's quite amazing. And this is the teachings of Kapila Dave. Maharaj, is it Bhagavatam, uh, Canto 1, 324? Canto 3. Okay. Canto 3, uh, chapter 26, verse 30. Okay. Uh, this, is, uh, this is amazing purport. Those of you who are scientifically uh, inclined will find this quite amazing. Uh, 34. Mm -hmm. Three twenty six thirty four. Uh, 
the fundamental principles of material nature chapter 26 mm -hmm. if we go to verse 34 mm -hmm. Okay, this might be a little bit hard to understand, but we'll read it anyway. The activities and characteristics of the ethereal element can be observed as the accommodation of room for the external and internal existences of the living entities, namely the field of activities, the vital air, the senses, and the mind. Okay, I'm going to bring it up. Purport. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, the mind, the senses, and the vital force for living entity have forms, although they are not visible. That's a powerful statement. The mind, the senses, and the vital force or living entity have forms, although they are not visible to the naked eye. Form rests in subtle existence in the sky. So, the sky manifests form, and that's in the, that's the, tel, the subtle existence of form. And internally, it is perceived as the veins within the body and the circulation of the vital air. Externally, these are invisible forms of sense objects. The production of the invisible sense objects is the external activity of the ethereal element, and the circulation of vital air and blood is his internal activity. A little hard to understand. That subtle form exists in the ether, has been proven by modern scientists by transmission of television, by which forms or photographs of one place are transmitted to another place by the action of the ethereal element. So this is also accepted by scientists that uh, transmission using electronic devices of forms, photographs, and other forms of are transmitted through the ethereal element. This is very nicely explained in this verse. And then Prabhupada goes on, this verse is the potential basis of great scientific research work, where it explains how subtle forms are generated from the ethereal element what their characteristics and actions are, and how the tangible elements, namely air, air, water, fire, earth, are manifested from the subtle form. Mental activities or psychological actions of thinking, feeling, and willing are also activities on the platform of the ethereal existence. The statement in Bhagavad Gita that the mental situation of the time of death is the basis of the next birth is also corroborated in this verse. Mental existence transforms into tangible form. This is a good point. Mental existence transforms into, as soon as there's an opportunity due to contamination or development of the elements from subtle, from subtle form. Uh, go up a little bit, can't see anymore. Yeah, okay, that's it. So, when at the time of death, when you, your consciousness focuses on something, it develops a particular formation on that focus. And based on that focus, that, that image carries you to your next situation mm -hmm. through the ethereal element. The ethereal element is the most subtle of all the elements earth, water, fire, air, ether. Creation comes from subtle to gross, and annihilation comes from gross to subtle. So from Mahavishnu, and then Shirodakshay Vishnu, or Rabbadakshay Vishnu, then Brahma, then Shirodakshay Vishnu, then the elements, and the elements manifest themselves, starting with ether, and ether contains um, the uh, unmanifested forms and as they come down to the more gross level they become manifested and every then from ether comes air from air comes fire from air, fire comes water from water comes earth and then 
we have what we call the actual manifestation of the physical forms. This is all due to the mental focus of Lord Brahma, who focuses on how to develop these forms through meditation. And as he's meditating on his service, he creates these uh, forms through these different elements, and then they manifest as the forms within the material energy, which is the 8,400,000 species of life. Well, what's interesting here in this uh, report, it says this, uh, this particular verse is the potential basis of great scientific research where it explains how subtle forms are generated from ethereal elements with their characteristics and actions are and how the tangible elements, namely the sudden and all these things produce the subtle form, are coming from the subtle form. And of course, subtle form leads to gross form. So just like when we engage in devotional service and we are practicing the process of um, we're, de we're developing a consciousness of Krishna. And as that consciousness of Krishna starts to form late in the subtle body, it becomes more and more prominent. And then it becomes fixed in the mind. So it's not happening. You, you don't fix the form of the Lord all of a sudden in your mind and expect that to manifest. It gradually comes through the process of devotion which is building that form within your mind, and then at one point the form appears. Just like when you chant the holy names of the Lord, you're chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and when you are, are absorbed on the sound vibration, as mentioned by Srila Prabhupada, the form of Krishna automatically appears in your mind, because the name and the form are non-different. So through the name, the form manifests through your meditation on the name. So this is also true with all activities. And just like it says that <clears throat> when a, um, I, I forget it is, what is it? A, uh, yeah, a grasshopper, or what is it? A, a, one of the little insects, he sees <clears throat> the butterfly coming to eat him. And then he meditates, he, he, the butterfly comes into his consciousness. And then when he's killed by the butterfly, he becomes a butterfly in his next life. Because that's the last thing he saw by his vision. <clears throat> So this is a, a very interesting verse because it helps us practice devotional service more effectively when we understand the importance of the subtle energies. And as we practice devotional service, our consciousness gets purified from gross to subtle, not from subtle to gross. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the sense that um, we we stop performing sinful activities on the waking level, but the root cause of these sinful activities remain in seed form on the subtle level. Just like they say, just like sex life. So the subtle root of sex life is profit, material profit, adoration, and distinction. So on the gross level, one may be free from the activity, but on the subtle level, it exists in another form of, its same, of itself. And until the subtle roots are removed, the gross roots can again reappear. Because just like when you cut grass, or you, let's say when you cut a weed from the ground, if you're using some machine, you're cutting it at ground level, but the root is still there. So therefore, the root will again cause the, the plant to grow. But when you go below the surface and extract the root completely, then the plant is completely 
you know, out. It's, it doesn't go back anymore. So in our process of devotional service and for purification, we shouldn't be satisfied with the development on the physical level because still those subtle desires, which are the root cause of the, the um, physical contaminations, still may exist. And therefore, purification comes completely only when you actually reach to the point of seeing Krishna face to face. Until you see Krishna face to face, then uh, by stopping at a certain level of subtle purification, that subtle can again reawaken the gross. And then one, this way we see sometimes, um, a great soul will come all the way to the level of prema bhakti and fall down because there's still some subtle root of contamination there. For instance, there was um, one story, one great uh, spiritual orator on the scriptures. He was known to speak and people would come in large numbers to hear him. And there was always a pin drop silence when he spoke. He spoke so convincingly with so much complete knowledge on the Shastras. One day when he was giving his lecture, this was of course outdoors, uh, one very elevated uh, lady, I believe her name was Krishna Priya, she came and she sat down in the back part where the people were and listened to his lectures. But Krishna Priya could not stop chanting Hare Krishna. She was addicted, absorbed in chanting. So she would also chant while she was listening to the lecture. Now this uh, orator, I think his name was Rupa Kaviraj or something. Uh, he became a little bit annoyed to seeing this lady who was sitting in his lecture and chanting Hare Krishna at the same time. So he actually said something to her to uh, restrict her, which was somewhat strong. He was a little harsh. Um, she uh, didn't respond. She remained quiet, but she also continued to chant because she could not stop chanting. She had reached that stage of spontaneous chanting. But because he had offended her, he spoke to her in the wrong way, uh, he, he fell down from his level of bhakti down to a much lower level, almost like a neophyte again, because of that offense. So here's an indication of the little subtle root of some material attachment again, reawakens an, a gross physical activity, which causes one to, again, slip into, into material energy again. So um, Kapila Dave, his um, teachings are very scientific. And you can see from Srila Prabhupada's um, purports, if you have some scientific acumen, it might help you, at least that's not so complicated with so many of the wrong things. It might help you uh, go deeper into the science of Sankhya as taught by uh, Lord Kapila Day. And of course, Kardam Muni, after his son was born, he left home and he left his wife now with her son. And she was intelligent and also understood her best interest. So she started to take instructions from her son. It's interesting. Usually the mother is the one who guides the son. But in this case, as Prabhupada pointed out, although she was the mother, she took the position of subordination to learn 
the complete science of bhakti. Mm -hmm. So from the, I think it's from the, uh, I'm not sure, 24th chapter, 25th chapter, it gets really into the philosophy of Kapila Dev, which culminates in the devotional service to the Lord. So it's a great section of the Bhagavatam. It's studied by many people. And you'll, you can learn a lot about how this cosmic manifestation works and how to disentangle yourself from the uh, complexities of the material energy. As it says in the Shastras, uh, material energy is, com uh, what's the word? Uh, endlessly, endlessly mutable. Mutable means changeable. Material energy is always changing, changing, changing. And therefore, people get lost in the material energy. And uh, they also look for change as a way to find inspiration in their activities. But for a devotee, nothing changes. The only thing changes is their consciousness. They perform the same activities and with the same desire to engage in devotional service and please the Lord and purify their consciousness. And that way, they move the material energy by their consciousness and they're not moved by the material energy. Consciousness is the force that moves the material energy because material energy is jutta, it's dead, can't move by itself. But those who develop a consciousness outside of the material energy can move the material energy to facilitate their activities in devotional service. In other words, although the material energy might be all around, they are not disturbed by the, the activities, the movements of the material energy, which you'll see, this is a, a somewhat of a fine point that maybe some of you can identify with, but you sometimes you notice people are acting similar Many people are acting similar on that same day around that same time period because you'll see the modes have an effect and as the modes increase according to the particular mode, people act in different ways. Sometimes you'll find people are, are just very pleasant and happy in general. Sometimes you see they're very miserable in general. Sometimes you see they're in anxiety in general. Sometimes you see they can't control their activities in general. So these things are all inspired by the movements of the material energy. And you can see how people who are not devotees are under the influence of one of the three modes of material nature. But a devotee is transcendental because they stay on the spiritual platform by keeping themselves connected through the process of devotional service. Okay, so we can maybe conclude here and see if there's any discussion. Hare Krishna Morris, thank you so much. I, I lost track of time as you were speaking. So much information. Thank you so much. If there are questions or comments, uh, we ask devotees, I'm looking at from the host, she's requesting that if you could um, uh, raise your hand or post a question that way, I don't miss anybody. I don't want to skip anyone. So, or if Anuradha Devi Dasi has a question. So go ahead, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Gumaraj. Please accept my humble obeisances. So glorious to Sri Prabhupada. Um, I really like this story about this lady who chants on the lecture of uh, this uh, uh, devotee. And uh, because this teaches what we can learn from this story. I was just thinking what I can learn, like for myself, um, practical, um, what can I learn? So uh, I was thinking, to really see good qualities in devotee, uh, not uh, offending, because she was chanting uh, in the lecture, but chanting is something very positive in 
uh, Krishna consciousness. And if uh, you see something negative there, it's, it's a reflection of your own thing you need to deal with. So it's really important that we are like bumblebees and not flies and see like a bumblebee, the nectar um, or from the devotee that we can uh, churn out something positive from the very negative thing. But this is, of course, practice because the six enemies can uh, attack um, the mind, ego, etc. But that we at least try, like that we can remind ourselves, oh, I'm negative now. I have negative emotions toward this, but I should supposed to be positive. I was thinking like that, a story. Yeah, nice point. Thank you very much. That was really good. Yeah. Yeah, always stay... Mm. Try to see the good in everything or try to see Krishna within everything. Mm -hmm. Vishaka Shakti, well, let's see. She, is that a question from her? Yes, Marj, I'll read it. Yeah, that's um, my, my second daughter. Hare Krishna, Marj, please accept my humble obeisance to all glorious Shri Prabhupada. My question is regarding Lord Kapila as one of the 12 Mahajans. Is Lord mm -hmm. Kapila the only direct incarnation of Krishna who is also one of the Mahajans? If so, why or what is the significance of this? Mm, let's see. Um, we have the 12 Mahajans. Swayambhu, Narada, Sambhu, Kapila, Kumara, Mano, uh, Janaka, Prahlad, Bhishma, uh, Sukadev Goswami, uh, Yamaraj. Yeah, it seems like. <laughs> but he was teaching, uh, yeah, yeah, you actually pinpointed that, yeah, the rest are great personalities. Some of them are, are highly empowered sages, others are. Uh, manifestations of Krishna's certain Shakti energy, such as the four Kumaras, they are incarnations of the, the, the principle of transcendental knowledge. Um, yeah, that's right. So, but what he taught uh, was uh, not direct devotional service, but a process of coming to direct devotional service. Actually, if you study that third canto and you study Kapila Dev's teachings, you can also come to the conclusion that Brahman is the highest, that Paramatma is the highest, but without Srila Prabhupada's purports, you will definitely see that what Kapila taught is relevant on both the material level and on the spiritual level. Mm -hmm. So, because he spoke a lot about the fundamental principles that make up the material energy. Okay. So, yeah, he is, um, he is an incarnation, yeah, but as it says, later on in the same chapter that these different incarnations that are mentioned are either portions or plenary portions of the plenary portion of the incarnation of the Lord. So portions or plenary portions. So they are manifested for us because we see that there are different types of incarnations. Uh, I think there's six categories of incarnations. Kapila Dave would be in the category of, uh, no. let's see, maybe Purusha incarnations. Thank you, Marj. Marj, there's a question from Prikshit. I'm going to ask him uh, to speak. His question. Uh, yeah. It's a very deep lecture. 
And I don't know whether to begin with my questions. I have a ton of them, but I just have yeah. one. Well, I need a, we'll need a little volume per Um. Um, now we got echo. Yeah, I don't know why. I think you got to put your earbuds in. Yeah. Go to another question for me. How much? I'm going to go to the next question while he gets his um, earbuds on. I have a question from Radha Bhakti Devidasi. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories. Jai Shri Prabhupada, sorry. The story about the speaker correcting a woman for chanting in class was a little difficult for me to understand. It sounds like the speaker was correcting the lady for a very legitimate reason. I understand that perhaps he spoke harshly and he couldn't have, and he shouldn't have. But if someone on the level of Prema is correcting a neophyte devotee and that neophyte devotee becomes offended, wouldn't Krishna protect the devotee at the level of prema from fall, from fall down? Well, Krishna Priya was not offended. And she was practically on the same level as he was. Maybe even higher, we don't know. She was absorbed in devotional service. Um, but he was disturbed because everyone was listening to his lecture and he thought she wasn't listening to his lecture. So she, he, made a, he made a wrong evaluation. She was actually listening while she was chanting. chanting. But the, the underlining theme is he didn't get full attention from, from her, or at least he perceived he didn't get full attention. So he felt slighted. Yeah. And this reason why he spoke is because of pride. That's mentioned also in that past. He was proud. And he was thinking, you know, I know so much and everybody should hear from me. He was proud. She was humble. Although she was chastised wrongly, she was humble. So she was not a neophyte devotee in any sense of the term. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Um, maybe just a quick follow-up question. This might be a silly question, but if somebody is on that level of prema, how possible is it for that pride and ego to kind of creep in? Yeah, well, it says Bhakti Vinod Akhor makes that point, that one can, um, the, 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 what they call it, the, what is it, the word is, um, the uh, hmm. the last principle of material existence is the sense of pride. Uh, let's see, what does it say? One thinks themselves as good as God or an incarnation of God, or they start... In other words, although they made so much advancement, still there's this element of pride that remains hidden and it can come out under circumstance which we have in this case it's called the last snare of maya that's the term the last snare of maya so bhakti vinota course says anyone can fall from devotional service even on the level of prema the only way you cannot fall is when you see Krishna face to face, which is one of the stages of prema, on the, one of the higher stages of prema, because prema has eight stages. So, but what is that fall? Offense. Mm -hmm. So he committed an offense to her. We have a question from uh, Sri Devi Dasi. Mataji, you can go ahead and ask a question, Prabhu. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead with your question right away. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. My humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holiness. 
the subject of the mind is really very fascinating because everything manifests first in the mind and then from there it goes on to words and actions and so on so i was wondering when you said that the only way we can completely subdue everything is by seeing krishna face to face but that's a very very elevated stage and how can we get there well the thing is um in other words it doesn't mean you can't reach perfection it means that you can there you can fall down from anything less than that that's what the vinota court i'm not simply you know making this statement it's what the vinota court writes it in the bhajana rahasya when he talks about the different stages of bhakti and the different anarthas well, we have the example of the four uh, the uh, giant vijay in the spiritual world they were gatekeepers yet of course that was krishna's arrangement but still there's an element of uh of transcendental principle that is there that the gatekeepers giant vijay fell down and they were they were on the gates of vaikuntha in the spiritual world so so bhakti vinota kaur's analysis of the stages of bhakti make it clear that only when you can see krishna face to face and there's no chance of falling down and there's no chance of committing offenses because the higher stages you fall down from the fences you don't fall down from an arthas or general an arthas it's the the an arthas of offense so one can develop a sense of pride based on what they have achieved and who they are and how much they know this pride lies in a very dormant st stage and come may come out under a circumstance and this is the case with this uh person who fell down it was a circumstance that brought it out just like now we were pra we're practicing devotional service and sometimes we think we're okay but then again if a, there's a certain circumstance that we might be faced with just and then it'll show you where you're at <laughs> yeah a lot of times we think oh i'm making so much advancement but then some circumstance comes up and boom you it starts to reveal your attachments you're an artist mm -hmm. so there's just keep chanting oh, but bhakti vinoda kor gives the formula he says chanting hari krishna crushes all an artist so when you perfect your chanting to the level of sudanam then you are fixed on the spiritual platform you have to come to sudanam so he gives the formula hari nam Thank you Marge. We have a question from Prickshin. <laughs> he got himself situated. <laughs> okay. You on mute. Uh oh, he Wait, 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 wait. A Is it better now? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. I have to move to a different room <laughs> to get this out. Um I have a lot of questions, uh but I will just ask uh Sri Devi asked something that I wanted to so I'll since she's started there I will, I will continue with her question about um you said when the perfection comes when you see krishna face to face you mentioned that part and then i was thinking but there's a deity in the temple room and krishna is absolute so can you comment on on a person who may be elevated enough to see Krishna face to face through the deity, though, because we don't play down the deity and say Krishna is not well, yeah. the deity. We never say that. So that's my first question. That's you can't mine. see you can't see Krishna with these eyes. Premanjarita bhakti vilochanena satasa daiva radiation vilokanyanti yamshama sundra chintya guna sarupam. 
Okay. When your eyes have honeycombed with the nectar of bhakti and love, then you can see Krishna in the deity or everywhere. <laughs> mm, okay. That's that's the answer. I guess as soon as you started, I knew <laughs> that was that was the answer. I think. Thank you for bringing that. Can I ask another one too? This is a quick one. Yeah, that was a pretty right. good one. I hope I hope this one's better. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one I'll talk about Bhakti Maharaj, some of the things he did in the comment, and then ask my question about it. He was, as you well know, praised so much for his wisdom and for his preaching and was, you know enthusiasm in, in chanting and, and dancing and so on. And so sometimes some people wanted to praise him, um, but most of the time he would, he would go against that. And especially if his disciple tried to praise him, he really would stop you then. He would definitely stop you then. He wouldn't allow even the disciples to even say anything, especially in public, hmm? a, a disciple praising him. Yeah, um, I, have to, I have to learn that. <laughs> I'm in trouble here. <laughs> um, but that, that's that's that he saw that, and I know I know the reasons why because you said it in the lecture. So that's not a question, this is a comment. But I myself, I never talked about this before. The job that I had was professor of chemistry. As you can imagine in the material world, how do you think about professors? I don't think of myself that way as high, but many people did. My students did, especially if they liked my classes. So it was a constant fight all the time with a mind to tell you, listen, you are just a servant of a servant of a servant of a servant in reality, even though in university they're putting you so high, okay, because of because of the nature of a job. And I try to tell myself, listen, you're just earning a salary to put food on the table and shelter for your family. That's all. But it was a constant thing because everybody, oh, he's a professor. Chemistry, chemistry, the subject I couldn't deal with. And he's teaching a PhD level. This has been a fight <laughs> today. He brought it up. Okay. And so um, and I, tell you, I can tell you that the, the ideal chemical formula. Okay. <laughs> enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. With, with bhakti. With bhakti as the, mm. uh, in the laboratory of devotion. When you mix enthusiasm with love. But the laboratory conditions okay. have to be done. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in chemistry, you can have the ingredients, but the laboratory conditions are not right. The formula, the experiment, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so Bhakti is like that. The ingredients okay. and the right mood. Okay. Enthusiasm with love. Um, so then, can I finish what I was going to say? Because um, it's does it relate to why humility is stressed so much? Because the way your Papa defines humility in the, in the Bhagavad Gita is one should be careful not to have the honor of being praised so much. Right. Sign of humility. So is that why humility is the very first thing that, that Krishna talks about in that? You know, in, that well, that statement is you know, is very direct about what is the definition of humility. But in other places, it says that humility is so elevated, it's an element of bhakti itself. Okay. Okay. Um, so out of all the qualities, when you, in that verse you're referring to, which is from the 13th chapter, mm, eight verses 8 through 12, yeah. mm -hmm. it says, amanitam adambitam. So the first thing is mentioned is humility. Mm. And that is called the 20 items of knowledge. So humility is actually a feature of knowledge, along with being a, ca a quality of one's character. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, says outside uh, of that is ignorance. Okay, yeah, ahead. humility allows for receptivity. Mm. Okay. When one is humble, then they can receive the knowledge, they can receive uh, instructions they can understand things easier mm. humility sort of decomplicates our mind and makes it receptive to the elements of bhakti especially the chanting of the holy names mm. <laughs> now uh, humility no. <laughs> yeah humility is it's it's an internal development 
of a consciousness, it may manifest itself externally, but one could be externally humble and not be really humble on the inside. So uh, it comes out by that statement you said, one who does not want the distinction to be honored by others. Mm. So yeah, when one starts to become honored by others, um, we sometimes sit there and listen to it because we think we give the people a chance in our position to make that devotional expression. But then again, if we accept it, mm. then the false ego grows. But if we pass it on to the spiritual master, to Krishna, to the good qualities of the Vaishnava, then we don't uh, become infected by that wrong consciousness. Mm. So then it's good to say anything when you praise by saying Krishna's mercy or Guru's mercy that this is happening is not me. Yeah, yeah. Every, everything is coming from Krishna through Guru. But Guru's mercy is Krishna's mercy. It's not mm. his mercy. Mm. Okay. Sometimes there's a distinction. We say you have to get Guru's mercy and Krishna's mercy. But Krish Guru's mercy is Krishna's mercy, except that sometimes Guru's mercy manifests itself differently. How? By uh, allowing those who are unqualified to approach Krishna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Krishna is very strict, but it's only by the Guru that certain that people who are unqualified but have some desire can approach the Lord through the Guru. So Prabhupada said if the, the, the spiritual master recommends you to Krishna, then Krishna has to accept. Uh, I hold up, I have other questions, but other people may But if somebody prays directly to Krishna, Krishna says, well, that's nice. <laughs> <Good guru. laughs> Who are you? Who are you, you know? <laughs> every every Joe on the block is approaching Krishna in different ways. <laughs> Krishna doesn't really pay any attention to them. But when it comes through his pure representative, then it becomes a feature of devotion, a feature of mercy. So then what to do about... And this, I didn't want to go there, but since you brought it up, what to do about those who, especially in India, were raised to go to the deity to ask pretty much everything. I mean, this has been an issue here that, and I myself sometimes when you know, by the Lord's mercy and Guru's mercy get an opportunity to preach, we're telling people that Baba Gita says just approach the spiritual master, inquire from him submissively, and serve him. But many people have been raised, especially those Indian body people, been raised to go to Didi, even though they have a family guru, but they go to Didi and ask everything of the Didi. And I know I've gotten nowhere practically <laughs> not trying to change your mind because it's like how to teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> this is a situation they've been raised like that. So what to do? Well, yeah, there's there's also stories, there's but... also there's also stories in there. In the Shastra about people approaching the deity directly. We have Shakshi Gopal, that story. That's true, yeah. yeah. But it depends. I mean, you can approach the deity. The, one of the good qualities about approaching the Lord for everything is that you acknowledge that the Lord is the source of everything. And it's by his grace that you can achieve anything. It's not pure bhakti, but it has an element of bhakti by acknowledging Krishna's supreme position as the source of everything. Okay, in that sense, yeah, I can understand, in that sense. Yeah. yeah. I can understand. Thank you, there's a lot of things I've learned in one day. <laughs> anyway, I can ask more, but maybe other people want to. I'm also learning, learning from I'm your sorry. questions, thank you. <laughs>
Hare Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj you touched uh, upon uh, uh, right now in answering to the question about Guru's mercy and Krishna's mercy, the difference. Can you elaborate on that more? Please? It's just an element of difference. It's not completely different because you'll see statements that you need Guru and Krishna's mercy together. Guru's mercy is Krishna's mercy, but Krishna, the Guru can give you an element of mercy that generally Krishna doesn't give. And that means allowing the persons who are not so qualified to render service or get some, some benediction from Krishna. Um, and that's what the that's why he says the Guru is the mercy manifestation of Krishna. If you approach Krishna, you may get it, you may not. If you approach the Guru and the Guru is satisfied, you'll get it. That's why those who understand bhakti understands that the spiritual master really is everything. <laughs> yeah. The although, we pray, although, although we pray to Krishna, still the spiritual master is everything. I'll make one quick comment here, the way you ended it. I remember Bhaktivedanta Maharaj one time, he says, pretty much the same thing you said, he said it in another way, because you said it, I just wanted to add that to it also from Bhaktivedanta Maharaj though. He just said, he said, that's why Krishna consciousness is Guru consciousness. He just ended it like that. You have to depend on Guru. You have to depend on yeah. Guru. Yeah. It's, it's Krishna mm -hmm. consciousness is Guru consciousness. Mm -hmm. I will just throw that in. Yeah. Yeah. The Shastras emphasize the role of the Guru, the importance of accepting a Guru, the uh, need to inquire from the spiritual master. We find a lot of times people don't inquire. Mm -hmm. Marge, oh, I, would, I'm, I just got a chat. Let me see. Oh, that was from Radha Bhakti. She just made a nice comment. Krishna consciousness is Guru consciousness. Bhakti Tirtha Swami, thank you for that. Marge, I'm, I'm going to ask to see if there are any questions before I ask mine. If anyone else has any questions or comments, uh, please, um, I'm going through the list to see if there are any hands raised or any questions. This is a really nice topic. It, it takes us in so many, many angles. Marge, um, from the verse... Um, that we that you talked about uh, the, the 10th verse of chapter 3 and it talks about Lord Kapiladev that um, the Sankhya philosophy this was done for the first time by Lord Kapila. Marge, what is actually the relationship of Sankhya philosophy with Bhakti Yoga? It, it's, a, it's, sim, it's, it's practically the same thing except it Sankhya means to count, that through, through the process of elimination, and first of all, listing the, tw the 24 items and going through each one of them and realizing these things are not eternal, you come to the platform of spirituality. Then from there, you come to Brahman realization. Then from there, you have to go higher and engage in devotional service. So counting means to eliminate these things as not eternal, not spiritual. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. Mind, intelligence, false ego, the five senses, the uh, the the 10 senses the, and the uh, sense objects. All these are material. Thank you, Marge. Make sense now. Now it's adding up for me. <laughs> Took me a while to understand that. That's a question by Dear Krishna Prabhu. Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj, please accept my humble messages. All best to Shila Prabhupada, all best to you. Uh, no, no question, Mataji. Just wanted to say thank you for this particular question and answer by Maharaj because we are going to cover 
karma yoga chapter 5 tomorrow in our namatta and i will always had a hard time uh, comparing gyan yoga and bhakti yoga so maharaj just gave a beautiful answer in two sentences and my job is very easy tomorrow thank you maharaj for that i've been struggling with the question for i don't know how long so i'm so glad that maharaj made it very easy sankhya pretty for elements next is brahma next is bhakti yoga thank you maharaj you made it so simple for me thank you so much Yes, Shanky is neti neti, not this, not this, not this, not this. But well, what is this? After you eliminate everything material, then what is it? And you have to come to the next stage. Are there any, are there any other comments, last minute comments or questions? And if anyone has questions. since that are not related to this verse you know anything i'm 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 sure my marge would love to answer A- any questions yeah. any thoughts even what we have discussed in the past few verses if there are any you know realizations please um do ask i'm looking for uh just one more um uh, go ahead it's it's not a question just uh uh Maharaj has already made a comment on it. I just wanted to talk a little further about it. And that is consciousness is the force that moves the material energy, the gross material energy then. Can expand on it a little bit more. Yeah, the scientists can't, they don't understand consciousness. One of our devotees <laughs> met one, of, one very great scientific atheist and uh, there was other religionists there and these other religionists were trying to debate with him but our devotee at the end said uh what is consciousness and he couldn't answer he actually admitted i don't know we can't understand what is consciousness mm-hmm. because they understand it and the consciousness is not produced from something material although sometimes they say when matter reaches a certain level of interaction consciousness appears but there is no example of that anywhere mm. they just say that it's more like a bluff mm. the consciousness is spiritual mm-hmm. and therefore matter can only be moved, moved by uh, a person <coughs> It's like you have a computer, nice machine, got a lot of information in it and does so many wonderful things, but you need an operator. So we are the operator inside this body, the soul. The soul is consciousness. Mm-hmm. Right, can I make one comment that really quick for about research? from what i i found out cuz i've been in it for a few years i would say earlier in my life um science, because i worked with them and some at brandeis some of the great scientists in the world literally were actually in that school some of them have won nobel prizes for and that, so i got to work with them as a graduate student so i found out how they think <laughs> that's how i finished and so um it 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 may seem like they start with consciousness but if there is at all there's very little of it they use material material what they know for material energy not even so much consciousness what's already been established and not even articles before and they take it and then the rest of it and you might shock you to hear this assumptions 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 and more assumptions and they know yeah. they could be wrong and they try it anyway and if it works fine if it doesn't work to so the whole way they write the articles so well it seems that this is happening it seems that that's happening um we are, you know so there's no real conclusion it's all super bad is already talked about relative knowledge relative knowledge yeah and that's why yeah. they have so much they have their position and they get their pay so they have to come up with something something exactly <laughs> so it's bluffing mostly <laughs> yeah that's true yeah i was just looking at a, an article that i had saved many years ago and uh, it was about the uh, the mirrors effect the mirrors effect is a particular uh, experiment done by einstein it's a theory um 
and what it says is that objects that are appear within the cosmos are reflected through light that is refracting and objects that appear in a certain area are not really where they are. They may be millions of miles away from the, where they appear, but due to refractions of light, they, have, they seem to appear. So uh, Einstein really made that, but they kind of ignored that theory and were making uh, experiments based on what they could see with their telescopes and what other machines they used. But then finally they realized that it's all wrong. So 35 years of research they had to throw out. <laughs> Just a waste of time. There's a lot they threw out actually. There's a lot, <laughs> wasting money. So you, that's why Prabhupada was so strong exposing this, the, uh, the scientists because they're in a position to, uh, you know, to give information that's all false and people believe it. It's like the thing where we're fighting with, even devotees don't, that the, the, the moon is closer, uh, the, the, the moon is farther away from the earth than the sun. And Prabhupada says, based on Bhagavatam, it's 1,600,000 miles farther away from the earth than the sun. But all the scientific theories say the moon is closer. Well, Prabhupada, in his discussions with his devotees, makes the, some, of the, some of these points to show how the cosmic uh, energies are moving, how the uh, planetary systems. That's why he said we want to build this TOVP to show the actual arrangement of the cosmos to, to the world. And people, once that planetarium is built, people will come from all over the world just to see it. And Prabhupada, I mean, Prabhupada gave the formula and then through taking his information and the words of the scriptures and others, uh, devotees have formulated this, uh, this structure of the universe, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. I'm just going to um, do a one uh, roll call <laughs> to see if there's anyone else has any last minute questions or comments. And um, if there isn't, I'm just looking down the list here. Okay. Raising my hand, but anyway. Oh, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. I, mean, I could ask, I mean, I still have a half a page of questions still, so I don't think I don't have, I have a whole lot still. When are we stopping? Because I don't want to really hold up Maharaj too much. Yeah, so well, Sri, contact him later on. yes, can you ask your long question, your list of questions to Maharaj question. personally? But Sri, uh, Sri yeah. Devi, yeah, your, because... Give me, give me your most important question, Pariksha. He's going to say all. all <laughs> I told you, Maharaj. <laughs> He's going to say all. No, I don't see one that's less important than the other. Um, I just make one comment. Scientists are grouping in the dark. I mean, honestly, whatever they come up with, they still group in the dark. Um, many of the what they found out that we teach, literally teach, this constant and this, you know, I can go, go on one, another, one, one after another. They never really, really, really got the numbers even molds and all those things, they never really got the numbers. They inferred it. They inferred it. They never do experiment, but they say, oh, it seems to be going this way and it's going to end at this number. Therefore, let's take this number. So it was really an assumption all this while. And I feel sometimes yeah. that I've been paid to do all this kind of stuff. If Prabhupada makes that point. They, they have their theories, it goes on, and then after some years, they throw it out and come up with a new one. Constantly. Constantly. They say, they say, uh, well, it's a process, and it's 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 a it's in we're in progress coming to the truth. And Prabhupada said, "Well, then you're a student, you're not a teacher." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so then, you can't you can't teach from the position of learning. You have to learn and then know and then teach. Mm. Otherwise, you're you're just uh, you know a cheater. Yeah. 
T-E-A-C-H-E-R. Take those letters and change them around. You get C-H-E-A-T-E-R. <laughs> Teacher and cheetah. Okay. <laughs> same same letters. <laughs> I learned something new today. Teacher and cheetah. I love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 Love that one. Mars, that's a question from Sri Devi. Sri Devi, you can go ahead and jump in and ask a question. Very quick question, Guru Maharaj. How would you address the problem of mental health issues? Devotees have so many difficulties when we read this verse. How can we explain to them that really chanting is the key and uh, it may... It may well, mental say, health issues, we, we know just by telling people to chant Hare Krishna is not enough. Therefore, we have devotees who, are, who do counseling because the mind is so complex that it can change things around so easily without any, you know, reason. So we have devotees who are trained in counseling, who have psychological degrees, who are, have, uh, some, uh, what we say, success in helping other people. So we recommend people go to a counselor. We have, there are a number of recommended counselors who are available within this society. Just like recently, one lady, she was coming to me with so many problems and I referred to, to one, another lady who has a great track record for helping devotees. She can help you see your problem from a different angle and give you, help you to empower yourself to overcome your problem. So you need that. You need someone to help you see it, who is neutral, who can see it not from a, any point of personal interest, but as a principle. And then they can empower you by their words and by their abilities to take charge of your life and overcome your problems. So you know that as a counselor, right? You do that with, with people in married life, right? And individuals also, Guru Maharaj. Huh? And also individuals. Yeah. So you have to have the acumen, the ability the training. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully answered. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. That was very helpful. Okay. Thank you so uh, much, Maharaj. Um, I think there aren't any questions. I think we we exhausted you, Maharaj, with all our questions. That's Thank okay. Lunch. I'm just holding off. I still have more. Anyway, lunch will taste better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Maharaj. And we thank the devotees for joining us online this morning. It's always nice, always nice to hear from Mark because there's so many questions and, you know, and, and we take him, we take Maharaj to all this journey of us. Maharaj, again, Vanchal Kaputa Biascha, Kripa Sindha Be Evacha, Patita Nam Pavine Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namo Namaha Ki Jai Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah, thank you very His much. His Holiness Chandramali Swami Ki Jai. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Maharaj, and thank you to all the yeah. devotees for joining us. Mm. And wish you all a wonderful day and see you all online for our next session tomorrow morning's class. Hare Krishna.